For over 90 years, we've been crash testing our cars in the tireless pursuit of automotive safety. At Volvo, safety's been first since 1927. We've saved millions of lives with the invention of the three-point seatbelt in 1959. At Volvo, we've made driving safer for you and them. Visit safety.finleyvolvo.com to learn more. So they say if you give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. But if you give a man a bank, he'll rob everybody. The good news for you is Private Money Club runs solely on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which means no banks allowed. So finally, there's a community for real estate entrepreneurs where it is truly a win-win solution. This community is a place where you can connect with other lenders and other borrowers, and the end results, massive growth for you. You get to build your real estate empire, and you get to do it solving other people's problems. So if that sounds like a place you want to be, well then join us. Go to privatemoneyclub.com forward slash Kelly. And if you want 500 bucks off, just add the code Kelly500 and I'll knock 500 bucks off the premier membership. We'll see you on the inside. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast where attitude is everything. On today's show, we generally don't record on Saturday, but there is a special man here, a very, very special man. There's a Superman here. This man had 33 surgeries before he was 11 years old that resulted in a unilateral amputation below the knee. And most of the time, the 33 surgeries would take somebody out. Then if that didn't take you out, then the amputation would take your mindset out. But this man said, I was here for a purpose and started working as far as uh, in, the, in the sports realm and ended up getting a scholarship and going to college on a scholarship, even with only one leg. Now, after that, what's amazing about it is he got into the, uh, the professional uh, side. He started becoming su successful that way. But to my knowledge, he was kind of hiding that a little bit. And once he started to speak about what actually was happening, so he was hiding that amputation. Once he started to speak about it, it opened up a whole different realm, including, including being one of the top keynote speakers in the world and speaking at the NFL Combine, which we're going to be talking about here in a second. But it is my absolute honor, my absolute pleasure to be able to welcome to the show Mr. James Dixon. I am honored, man. Thank you so much. Man, that introduction is like uh, uh, here are the highlights of my life. And I'm like, I can't wait to make even more impact with the cause of Christ and with brothers like you in my life. Man, I'm honored. Thank you for having me. So so talk to me about that. Like, uh, when was your first surgery? How old were you when you had your first surgery, James? Okay. I was only 90 days old, three months of age when I had my first surgery. And at the time, the doctors thought, I, it was just a splint that would be needed. It was a mistake. Every surgery I had was exploratory. Everything was just one mistake on top of another until finally I had that 33rd surgery. So what age were you when you had the 33rd surgery? I was 11. In fact, let me tell you, at 11, um, I didn't know I was having the amputation. Um, my mom sat down with me and asked me, uh, this Kelly, she said, um, what do you think or how do you feel about losing your leg? And I said, no, but that's because I didn't know that that amputation would change my life. What I would lose in a limb would one day give me my purpose. All I wanted to do was to keep the leg. All 33 surgeries were about keeping the leg and the scar tissue had gotten so bad. There was nothing. I had never walked in my life. I was 11. I never walked. I'd never been able to run, never been able to interact with other kids. I sat on the porch with my grandmother, and my neighbors used to refer to me as the crippled kid on the porch. Not You never walked. It wasn't walk with a, a splint or anything like that or nothing? No. I had a the, the brace they had made for me uh, only allowed me to have a walker to, to advance that way, but being able to walk. Uh, independently do the things that every other child does and wasn't able to do. And because of the constant surgeries, every six months I was having some sort of surgery, some sort of recovery. All of those things kept it, kept me from being able to interact with other kids in a normal way and play without getting injured. 
So talk to me about the mindset, like, uh, you know, at that time, because, you know, now you can work on your mindset. You found it through lifting weights, through working out and having a lot bigger muscles than me. I didn't even want to put you on the, like the thumbnail. For, if you guys go, when you listen, to, when you watch this, if you go to the thumbnail on YouTube, like, I didn't want to put your picture on because you got the, you got the pipes out, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, but, but let's go back to that part of it as far as how you like, take us into the mind of a, you know, seven, eight, nine, my son right now is 11 years old. So this right. is hit. this is hitting me right now. Take us into that mind. Like, what are you feeling, you know, and what are you going through not being able to interact with other kids? Man, I got to uh, tell you, one of the, my earliest memories is watching kids running back and forth and walking on grass. That was one of my biggest dreams. I wanted to know what it felt like to have grass under my feet. I wanted to know what it was like to, uh, to tackle, wrestle, to play tag, any of the things that, that they did. When it came to Easter, watching the kids in my, in my family and neighborhood be able to run out, pick up eggs, and, and then people have to literally hand them to me uh, because I couldn't go anywhere. You know, just feeling left out. It felt like life was on fast forward and I was in on pause, um, trying to find... What's my purpose? Why am I here? Why can't I do things with other kids? I just felt left out, but I had a grandmother who kept calling me Superman. She just kept drilling that into my head that no matter what I wasn't able to do, there was something developing with me. I was becoming something. In fact, she bought me a weight set. So when you refer to the photos, and I appreciate the compliments, I'm working hard, I'm working hard. Uh, I, she bought me a Hulk Hogan weight set. And I used to listen to the audio tape, man. And I, I was a hawkster, man. I'm all in with the hawkster, right? And and I had a little two five pound weights, and I'd curl, 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 walk in there and say, "Grandma, look at these." And she'd feel it and tell me, um, you know, about how powerful I would be. And having the mindset uh, imparted into you by someone who can believe in you unconditionally is the only saving grace I had, because. I didn't have experience of success. I didn't know what it was like to win. I didn't know what it was like to even participate or compete with other people. So talk to us about your grandma, because this is, this is a huge thing where uh, my friend Carrie and I were just talking about it before we got on and uh, him and I went to uh, middle school and then on to high school together. Uh, so um, we'll be saying hello to Carrie. We'll say a big shout out to him right now. But Shout out to <laughs> we were talking about it and we were talking a lot about mindset. And it's amazing though, because your grandma laid the heart set that developed the uh, mindset that ultimately developed your skill set, which is, uh, is, you know, second to none. Can you talk, oh, to, can you talk about the heart set of your grandma? Because that encouragement is so massive and it really changed the vibe around you because your vibe could have been, woes me, I'm broken. I'm going to continue right. on to this part of it. Uh, what were some of the things that she was saying over and over again that kind of shifted that vibe for you? Well, one of the things that she would uh, always say to me, she'd wake me up early in the morning um, and maybe 4 a.m. and I'd sit at the coffee table with her and I didn't have coffee. She would give me water and she'd drink coffee. You know? And she would sit there and she would talk to me about what I was going to do one day. She would tell me that you are, God has got a purpose for you and gave me Philippians 4.13, which became my life verse. And it's the thing that I have engraved on many of my prosthetics, the legs that I wear. And uh, today is, a, is an homage to her. Even the Superman that I wear, it's not about the cartoon character. It's because she named me that. She was telling me that, that right now I'm just dealing with kryptonite as a small child, but that one day I would find out just how amazing I would be. That all of this is not for naught. And she would just encourage me. And, and as she would tell me those things, I began to believe them because of who she was and how passionate she was for me. I borrowed her belief system until I learned to believe in myself. When I was 11, you know, I, wanna, I wanna say this because I wanna show you how it came into play. Mindset that led to uh, my adaptation and development of a skill set. Um, I went to the Chicago Shriners Hospital. I didn't know I was going to be staying there. My grandmother was in Indiana, and I had always been beside her. She'd been with me. She'd been my recovery aide, my therapist, my physical therapist, you name it. And 
when I was in Chicago Shriners Hospital, I thought I was going for a visit. Um, they did a tour and showed me around and I'm in a wheelchair as a kid. And my mom walks in and she says, um, I hope you enjoyed it. I said, I did, it was very nice, everyone seems nice. And she says, well, you're gonna be living here for a while. And so I didn't understand what that meant. My father walks in and uh, for the first time in a long time in my life, he's engaged and he's involved and he's there, but it's because both parents have to agree that the hospital can become my temporary guardian. My father walks in and says, son, if you ever need anything, reach out to me. And I realized at that moment that I'm being left at the hospital. But since I was uh, accustomed to being in the hospital for a short period of times, I assumed that somebody would be coming back. I'm in the hospital, I wake up the next morning and my, my leg is gone. No one told me. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm crying. I look to my right and there's a kid named Matt. I look on the other side and there's a kid named Gilbert. And Matthew passes away my third day there. His parents give me one of his teddy bears. Gilbert is on the other side of me. And Gilbert's mom uh, uh, comes in and signs over her parental rights because she could not take care of a paralyzed child anymore. She said, I just can't do it. So I saw someone pass away. I saw another kid get abandoned. And that's what I was full of fear, that now no one's coming back for me. And I, my grandmother, who didn't drive, got on a Greyhound bus, showed up at Chicago's hospital, forced her way in, came and encouraged me and spoke life into me when I needed it because, man, I was at, I was at my worst. My mother came back and she was there. She's working back and forth and stuff. But when I say I had to lean on her, when I was at my lowest and when she spoke into me, that level of sacrifice love is what propels me today. Talk about the baton moment. And what I mean by this is we all have a moment when the advice um, has to become real. We have to take the baton and now we have to run. And um, because we have, a, like when we have Grandma Ma sitting with us, it's almost as a protector. She's calling us Superman. She's saying it's just kryptonite, James. And That's right. And, but, but also there's a comfort because you know, if somebody tried to come into that, uh, hospital room and cause harm to you, you know, your grandma would have knocked them upside the head with a, you know, with whatever she could grab hold of. <laughs> but then there's a time where that baton becomes passed and that person maybe isn't there and can't be with you the whole way. And they're telling you, take this. Now it's your time to run. Now it's your time to speak life into others. Talk about that moment of, of you taking the baton. Wow. Well, in uh, Kelly, we, you're talking about a very moving moment for me. The baton for me, my grandmother uh, transitioned when I was in my 20s. And um, when she did, I felt like a big part of myself was gone because I had relied so heavily upon her emotionally. And since my confidence had been built around, I had my mom and I had my grandmother. But my grandmother had been such a key figure as far as that emotional part. When she was gone, I felt somewhat, I'd always struggled with acceptance on the outside. Inside the home, great. But when now that she's gone, who speaks over my life? Who speaks encouragement into me? And so I tried to hide um, the fact that I was an amputee, do everything I could to overcome uh, whatever physical limitations, uh, emotional challenges I was having, uh, I was like, I don't want to be labeled as that. And then, finally, I got to the point when I would turn 45, and I decided I was had enough of hiding. I wanted to honor her. I wanted to do something with that mantle, that baton that she had given. The investment she made in me, I wanted to give her the ROI because I, I didn't want to leave Earth and say, was she proud of me or not? I mean, she was such a, a pivotal person in my life that I wanted to give that back to her by the way that I lived my life. And so I wore shorts for the first time in my entire life unashamedly when I was 45. The moment I did that, it opened up the door and an avenue for me to share what she put into me into others' lives. It changed everything in my life. The thing I hid when I embraced and picked up that mantle, it opened up the door for me to speak 
into thousands and thousands of amputees around the world who were simply waiting for someone that they could identify with. And now the thing that I didn't mention is that you're an Under Armour model. Um, also, you're you're on uh, Absolute Motivation on YouTube, which is has 1.4 million uh, subscribers on it. Also, and your voice is heard throughout this. But hold on, you you yada yadded me for a second there because <laughs> you went from. 11 you skipped to 25 then you said i got to 45 you went 45 years without wearing shorts i did with the way that i even when i played sports i would wear the long basketball shorts if you can remember kelly in the eight in the 90s we got to wear it was like (laughs) like sports we look like like we're wearing long dresses today uh but i I would wear those and then we would get like high top socks so that we could cover it up. And then I would use one of those Michael Jordan knee braces, right? So that I could cover it up. And I learned to mimic the gait, really the way that everyone who was able-bodied walked. So it just looked like I was just walking cool or with a chip on my shoulder. And um, I would just never be open about, I I lived to to defy and deny that I had a wooden leg. And literally then I did have a wooden leg. It was 25 pounds heavy um 25 was no pounds problem. james 25, 25 pounds. pounds i had to drag that thing around i would i had to be calloused i had boils i had pain but i had I just endured i never let anyone know just how much pain i was constantly in because i was i was so determined to prove that i fit in that i belonged that i i, I had acceptance and and since i wasn't getting that from people i took it by force and uh But it was at 45 that I was like, I'm not concerned about how you perceive me. I'm thankful for who I am. This is my journey. This is a part of who I am. It does not limit me. It's just a part of me. It does not define me. I'm not limited. I'm not not handicapped. I'm capable. I'm able. I'm available. You know, that was the mindset shift. James, we're going to go to a quick commercial break, but while we are, what I want, we're, when we come back, everyone who's uh, watching and listening on this, um, first of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank you all for helping us to get into the top 1% uh, globally as far as all podcasts. Um, but when we come back, uh, James, we are going to talk about how when you're hiding, how it can impact every single relationship in your entire life and the depth of that impact. And we're going to get to that right after this quick commercial break. The way I see it is you've got two choices. You can either keep pretending like nothing bad's ever gonna happen to you, and then when it does, you're saying, "Uh uh-oh, or you can get ahead of what's coming so that when it does, not if, you're ready for it. And you're sitting pretty, sipping on Mai Tais next to the pool, working on that Caribbean suntan because you got it covered. So folks, it's time for you to learn the truth about money. It's time for you to take back control of your money so that you are ready for what's about to happen. By doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute success. No matter what comes your way, you're ready for it. And that's what I want for you, and I wanna help you with that. So go to chrisnoggle.com and sign up for the Wealth Webinar. We do them every Wednesday at 1 p.m., and you need to be there because it's time Uh Uh-oh, it looks like we piqued your interest in The Hideout. First of all, let me tell you what The Hideout is not. The Hideout is not for hustlers, for grinders, or for people who are looking for a shortcut to what the world calls success. The Hideout is about growing as men, creating lifelong friendships, and having the time of our lives. Are you ready to tap in to the endless source that will take you from success to significance? The hideout is two and a half days of hiking, biking, and doing the little things that it takes to create lifelong friendships. I find that joy is nothing more than falling in love with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. And that's when we see growth in every area of your life. Have you accomplished your goals professionally and financially, and you still thirst for something more? Has success in these areas come at the expense of far more valuable things like your family, your children, and your relationships? Alignment in business, strategic partnerships, 
and joint ventures all come from true relationships. The Hideout is designed to get to know people before you'll ever meet them. This is not your typical mastermind. The Hideout is focused on the one thing that will fuel everything, joy. And when joy is overflowing in your life, you'll find growth in your marriage, your relationships, and oh yeah, your business. Welcome back to the Kelly Cardenas podcast, uh, Mr. James Dixon, uh, absolute real Superman. And um, we were just talking about the impact of when you're hiding. And what I want, what I want you to, to understand and what the thing that I'm capturing and while I'm sitting in this, I'm watching the commercials. Um, James, I, I connected and I have bad... Um, maybe bad association or uh, comparisons. I've been known for this. I'm very known for bad comparisons, but I'm going to try one here. Okay. Because as I was sitting um, watching the commercials, I'm thinking that you may have had an amputation that you were hiding, yeah? But there are so many people out there that are tr hiding a true identity and or something that, that has happened within their life. Maybe it's a business that has failed and you don't want to talk about it. Maybe it's a relationship that's failed that you don't want to talk about. Maybe it's something that you think is a shortcoming that you're wearing the pants and not wearing the shorts and exposing that thing. And that's it's right. impacting so many other uh, relationships. So I, I really want to know, James, how did it affect impact other relationships i mean when you're say in the dating world or you know with your friends or whatever it is what type of impact did that have and how severe was that well w one of the biggest problems with hiding is the the fact that you have to always remember where you hid things right and make sure that you cover things and go back and cover so that the, nothing ever reveals the thing that you're most ashamed of I didn't want people to even see me walk. If we were walking in a mall, I would make sure that I walked in the crowd to try to be hidden. If, when it came to relationships or dating, I would deny the fact that I was an amputee. I would lie, I would say I wore a knee brace, anything to try to find acceptance because in the growing up in an inner city, growing up where people made fun of you, mocked you about losing your leg, about the one leg this, the crippled leg that, enduring those things made me uh, shy away from embracing that identity, right? And then when it came to um, interpersonal relationships, I found myself not allowing people to get close to me because I didn't want anyone to have that information on me. Uh, when it came to being uh, intimate, being married, and then, uh, you know, still ashamed to be naked uh, because you may not be accepted or looked at that way or always wearing my leg around people and not being able to swim or to do different things or, or wear a pair of shorts. Or, um, there were so many things that I did trying to hide, being afraid that even when I would have ch my children, that they would end up being disabled and that the only prayer request I had was God give them both legs. And, and that was my joy in the fact that my kids would have something, not realizing that all of that hiding was denying the thing that made me unique and that, that I overcame something. In fact, I, you can't become something without overcoming something. My hiding was blocking my voice and uh, me being able to be an advocate for others. My, my hiding was blocking my intimacy and the relationship of being vulnerable with other people. My hiding was making it so that no one knew the real me because I was keeping up this facade and it's so hard to keep a facade up because you, while you're holding that, that prop up, you never get to become the real you. It's hard to stay in character without denying your own character. At an early age, you know, you, you spoke about like your, your grandma, uh, you know, adding that faith component, right? But I know, right. as a, I don't know about you, but I mean, as a kid, when my dad would try and throw in some faith component, Sometimes I'd be a little angry because I would look at circumstance. I would look at what? circumstance and I would question and I'd be like, well, if this, this God that you're talking about is so amazing, 
then why are you and mom fighting right now? Why are we living in a one bedroom apartment right now? Why do we not have the clothes that the other kids have? Why is it that we have to do these things? Did you have those kind of feelings towards? I, I mean, let me tell you. Yeah, I not only did I have that feeling, I wondered if when grandma would, before we go to bed, um, we'd be on our knees and we'd pray, if I should die before I wake. I prayed the Lord my soul to take, right? We do these little prayers, a small kid and stuff like that. And then I remember wondering, if God is so loving, why didn't he love me enough to let me have a leg? If God is so accepting and so embracing, why is it that I, I, I'm i so different? Why am I the one that my father is denying that he's my father because of my disability? If God is so loving, why is it that girls won't date me because of my leg? Why is it, if God is so loving, why is it that I have this limitation and that everything that I'm trying to become, I can't overcome this thing? Why did he have to do this to me? What could I have been if he didn't do this? That was my struggle. Because if he loved me this much, then why did he leave me this way? And then I learned that his true sign of love is that he gave me something that made me so unique that he filled the void with who he is with what i didn't have and the very thing that i kept saying why 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 kelly when i found out that there was a mephibosheth in the bible that there was a biblical character that that was lame on his feet and david says to him when he's even repeating about himself, he said, I am but yet a dead dog. And, and David just ignores that and said, you will sit at my table and gave him royalty and authority. And I thought about that. That was like, man, there's somebody that I, like me in the scripture already, right? Is that in spite of what I don't have, it can be my avenue and venue to set me in places. When I look back now, I'm thankful that I didn't have because all of those voids have been filled. My voice, the uniqueness and the depth of, and the baritone sound that I have, everything that was given was a gift. It was a tool. That it, the, the, the learning to be able to self-soothe when I'm all alone, God was working with me because leadership becomes lonely. And there are times where you get isolated. Then finding out that in the humility and being able to become vulnerable allowed me to walk into relationships with men like you and share my with all humility and be like, I am flawed, I am mistaken, I am broken, but I'm your brother. And be able to accept those things, right? Everything that has happened, the loss of my limb gave me a pathway in life. And I got a leg up on the competition. <laughs> James. I don't know if God does it uh, this way with you, but he'll, he'll show me a big vision, right? It gets me really excited. But he won't show me any of the steps, and it doesn't happen exactly as fast as I think it should. Mm. Um, and I don't know if he deals with you that way. Maybe he, maybe he likes you Come more. On, maybe he likes you more. I believe it. <laughs> hey, he likes you more. He gave you that voice. He gave you them arms. You know what I'm saying? He, <laughs> he gave you a leg up on everybody. Um, but... He, a lot of times what God will do is he'll show me a vision, right? And he'll show me like, okay, this is what you're going to do. So a couple years ago, probably about five years ago, um, uh, I didn't know that I was going to make a career transition, but, um, but he did. And he said that it was going to be a, um, it was going to be a small theater. Then it was going to be a, a like uh, venue to the house of blues, which is going to be three to 5,000. Then it was going to be the Mandalay Bay event, event center, or MGM grand, like that kind of, uh, uh, scenario that was going to be 10 to 13,000. Then it was going to be Madison square garden, 17 to 19,000. Then it would be soldier field, which would be 70 to a hundred thousand. And, um, I remember asking, like, I remember him telling me that and it was just very clear. Boom. And, and in my childish side, I thought, cool, it's coming tomorrow. Well, James, <laughs> James, it, it still ain't came. Now it's, 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 it's working, it's coming. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. we're, we're about to do a, a small theater, uh, that's uh, okay. on Monday, wow. <laughs> but, but talk to us about this, this part of it, because again, God will give us a vision. He gave that vision to you through grandmama saying that. This is going to oh, be the kryptonite, right? Tell you, man, this is about to get crazy. You, you, and, uh, only you can, pre I will, those that can appreciate this really will watch. So 
my whole childhood, she was pushing the Superman, but it was not the cartoon character. The purpose of telling me about Superman is because he was eternally 33. The fact that he could hear the voice of his father, it was that he was a representative from a world that is uh, totally different than the one he lived in. He didn't, st he was unique, he, he was odd, but there was a purpose for it. And that the S is a symbol of hope. And when it's broken, when it's upside down, it's a symbol of resurrection. When she taught me that, that it wasn't about the cartoon. And yet here it is today. All of those things that were planted in me, I can show you pictures of me as an eight-year-old uh, leaning opposite because uh, my hips were so different, right? And, and just trying to stand there, but I have a Superman on my belt buckle and all that stuff. And today on my shirt, is a superhero, a cartoon character made in my image for children around the world, where I'm my own character, right? That somebody saw me and saw the way that I was built, the weights that she gave me, uh, it was so that I could work out and build my strength back from my surgeries, but it ended up coming up a way of life. And now here I am, I'm 49, I'm still lifting, I'm developing. And so the physique turns into opportunities to become modeled. And the very thing that I used to hide my body is now opening doors. My voice and learning to speak in church settings and all those things became so that I would overcome the fear when I was ready to embrace my calling, right? my purpose, uh, embrace my personage, and then remember that I'm, I don't have to be perfect, right? But I have to be in pursuit of something becoming something better. Um, brother, I gotta tell you, so I went from listening to motivational things to just, I would make little clips and, and uh, listening to people in the workout takes for to be less brown, people like you with your tremendous skill set, and, uh, in hearing those voices, to me just saying something, and one of the founders of like the YouTube channel, Absolute Motivation, hears me and says, I want to make you the keynote speaker. Brother, eight months ago, I, I quit a job working at a factory and began to walk in my purpose and those venues. Like me and you, man, my steps have been ordered before I could even take steps. I am I, the only thing that was crippling in me wasn't my body, it was my mindset. I didn't understand that there was a plan from the foundations, it just didn't look like it. My abandonment from my father, that gave me a reason so that I would be a better father. And then I would reconcile with him and then be able to fix my bloodline issues because of what Christ has done in my life. But I, I just, we don't realize the, the vision has been painted a picture. You just have to see it in the moment you do. You look back and go, my why is wrong to say it should be thank you. Can you talk to that, uh, that person? There's, there's always the, um, what I call James, the, the psh person. You don't understand. Psh, you don't understand my situation. And, um, there's always that person that is going to, you know, James, you don't understand. My father was 10 times worse than what your father was to you. Um, and I'm angry now. And I'm, I'm angry. The world is against me. Um, you know, I, I didn't have a loving grandmother that was telling me I was Superman. I had somebody, you know, talk to that kid. Oh, man, come on. Brother, I'm going to tell you this. I don't know who you are, where you are, but I want you to know this. That whether it's because of someone touches you and you've been molested, no matter what, and the things that we've been silent about and trying to hide, been there, being abandoned and feel that way, being poor and struggling. And then you have you can look at to see people that are bad seeming to win and you wonder what's the value in being good? Why should I do something different? And maybe you feel like you've been isolated and abandoned, but you're not being abandoned. God separates you sometimes so that he can work on you. And there's a protection around you that you may not see it now, but sometimes he will take an eagle and put them in, in a platform so that they don't get comfortable being with pigeons. You are being developed, you're being fashion and formed into something unique. You may, it may not seem like it now, but the greater your trials, the greater your triumph. There's something great coming. 
But in order to do something great, you have to overcome something great. That's where the testimony comes from. You have to be tested. Deli, you and I, people will look at you and think of the success you have at this moment without knowing the story behind you. Man, we, we are not what we are today without the stuff we went through. And if people had to walk in the steps that we've had to get, go through to get here, they would say, no, thank you. But I got to tell you, if you can endure, you win. If you can endure, you'll see the value. If you can endure, you'll look back and see that was a small sacrifice to pay off for the benefits we're getting now. What was the moment you said that at 45, you know, what was the moment that you said, I'm going to wear shorts? Like, take us to that time. Was it a buildup? Was it a buildup no. or was it just a, I'm going? No, I had, I had had enough of trying to lie and cover up and people say, I heard you lost a leg and I would be on the verge of fighting. I would use my size to try to intimidate people from bringing it up because I didn't want to be limited. I didn't want them to see me as flawed as I truly am. And so the tough guy was an acting. It was it was a pretense. And then what happened was uh, the insurance changed, and so pre-existing conditions in my job allowed me to get a prosthetic, and I was going to get a new one. And, and when they were making it, it was so much lighter. Technology had changed. This the legs now give energy return. And I was so like, wow, man, you need to tell me I'm going to be able to run without pain. I would be able to do all of these things. And they were like, yes. And I, so I wore shorts ready. And, and my mom showed up at the, the day that they gave me this new leg. And when I ran it, I ran away and ran back towards her. And one day, brother, I tell you why this would be so impactful, because she was never there during some of my, my, my biggest athletic moments. And the only reason why I played sports was because I wanted to prove to people that I could do what they do and I wanted validation. And so I ran, as I'm running in this leg, I come back and I see her teary-eyed. I see the process teary-eyed because they could see there was a breakthrough for me. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, finally, man, I, I'm not gonna hide. I can do everything everyone else can. This was a huge moment for me. Brother, I signed up and wearing shorts and I had been telling people I'm going to wear shorts when I get this new leg. If anybody makes fun of me, well, I'm fighting. But all of my co-workers wore shorts with me. And so they embraced my moment and lived that with me. They gave me acceptance around me in such a way. And I'm talking about feeling that type of validation and love from them and built confidence. And so I went to go do a uh, I thought it was a 5K, Kelly, so I, I, I don't look at things uh, right away. I, uh, there was another amputee who had seen me online, and she couldn't participate. She said, would you go in my place? And I'm like, 5K, you got it. I can do three miles, you know. Uh, well, I didn't even know that was three miles. I asked, you know, culturally, I just didn't know. So I asked this guy, he was skinny, white guy. I said, hey, you look like you run. He said, yeah. I said, how long is 5K? And he said, three miles. I was like, yeah, I do three miles, man. I do three. So on the way to the event, I picked up a pair of shoes from like a, a little a little cheap store, like $29 Nikes. I throw these bikes on. And I don't even need to break it. Man, I, it's just going to be three miles. You know? So I get out there, and I'm on the front line, and I'm flexing. I told my son, and my mom is saying, I was like, I'm about to win this thing. And I'm looking around, and I was looking at the size of some of the people, and I was like, well, all I got to do is get out on these people. I didn't know what the I am tattoo it meant on the arms of these guys. I was like, what is an I am, you know? Because I, I did, just didn't know they were Iron Man. And um, I was like, man, these guys, they look like they're pretty fit, you know? And so anyway, they, they're getting ready. to uh, sitting off the gun to start the race. And I'm like, okay, if I just get out early. Well, these guys uh, mentioned, I said, what made you that they were Iron Man? I said, man, what are you doing in something like this? Or, Why would you run a three-mile race? And they said, no, this is a marathon. So I was like, oh, there must be two races, a marathon, and then there's, there's the 5K that I'm in. And they're like, no, this is just a marathon. I said, this is a full marathon? And then the gun goes off, and I didn't take off. So I went over to the director. I was like, hey, uh, is there just... Is this this the marathon? Because I'm about to check out of this thing, right? I'm done. But the lady who's the amputee in the wheelchair 
who can't run is like, James, go for me, you know? And I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, one second. But is this, <laughs> is this three miles or full 26 miles? And they said, so, well, go ahead and go. So this is my plan. I'm going to start out running the people who are heavy set, and as long as I get ahead of them, I can quit after they quit, you know? Because I'm not doing 26 miles. I didn't, I didn't read the fine print. So I get out there and I'm running, and I'm trying to pass up certain people, and I'm gonna quit. And but my sons are out there, and I'm like, I'm telling them all the time, never give up, never quit. What you can do. So little kids, and then they like, yeah, you can do it, Daddy. I'm like, I'm gonna get around out of sight of them, then I'm gonna quit. And but then my son, the, the, he was 12 at the time, the the oldest of the two, he decided he want to run with me. So now I'm forced. And I'm like, hey, so I'm like, I need to tell him to go back be with mom, you know, for safety, you know, get out of here. <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm going to run with you. And then he's like, why are you running so slow? So then I was like, hey, let me give him something to do. I bet you can't catch the person at the front of the line. You do, I get you 100 bucks because I need to get rid of this kid. He's pushing the pace. He's making me go. And finally, uh, I start raining. I was like, this is my out. And then it stopped raining. So I'm like, man, everyone... Then I, so I'm going to quit finally because my side is certain, you know, I need to figure this out. And my, you know, I'm, getting, I'm like, I didn't know that your thighs could rub together in, in, because I never had that happen before. But I'm going to, but my leg is feeling so good on my prosthetic side that I'm starting to feel fatigue on my good leg. And I never felt that before. Right. But I'm like, let's, let's just, right, I'm going to keep going for a little while longer than I'm quitting. Well, here's what happens. <laughs> Every time I went to quit, that would be the, either the lady in the wheelchair, that would be the media, that would be my kids. That would be, so I'm angry that I can't quit. <laughs> it rained, it stopped raining. It just, there was nothing I could use. So I finished that thing. And I was like, I can't believe I didn't know I could sunburn either. I thought that black people couldn't sunburn. <laughs> you know, I, I never got sunburned before. Man, what is this? I learned a whole lot of things that day. Brother, but it was a great experience. Uh, I, I, I got the, I got the award and, and all those things. I'm so proud of myself. I'm happy. And I went to the car, and I ended up using all my vacation days at work to recover because I, I'm so sore. I didn't know what that was about. I didn't know you had blisters on your freaking feet. I, you know, all that David Goggins stuff talking about he really was dying. No, 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 that was not for me. But that was the end of it. So I went back to the weight room. But that was my first experience, brother. Very oh. short. Sure, I was motivated. It was a positive experience. But I encourage anyone to uh, never quit. <laughs> but make sure you don't sign up with something you don't know what it is. Oh, oh, my my stomach hurts right now, man. Oh my gosh, that, that's good. That's an ab workout. It counts as an ab workout for everyone out there that, that knows. Can, can you can you talk to about like God's sense of humor? Because I think a lot of times people are, uh, will see like a. You know, a situation like yours, growing up in an inner city, uh, grandmama, you know, uh, telling you you're Superman, you have to, 33 surgeries before you're 11, you have your leg amputated at 11. But talk about God's sense of humor, because I think that in that situation, I mean, you see the joy in you when you're talking about that. And it's the reality of, I'm not pressing through because I'm the man. It's like, now nah, I'm trying to get you out of here, brother, so I can quit real fast. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, because I don't think yeah. enough people talk about the, 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 the sense of humor of God. And he has to have a sense of humor. You know what I mean? I mean, oh, talk about man. that in your life. And listen, I have had so many moments where... <laughs> Uh, people have, um, they, they try to deal with me even gently, right? So I decided to go to a powerlifting event. I had always seen it online and stuff, so I went to one. And as I'm in the audience, uh, I was like, man, I wanted to sign up, right? But I never, I didn't know how to lift or any of those things um, it, like these guys did. Not, I'm not, I may have done some of the weights, but there was a techniques and things of that nature in the powerlifting events. And and the organized uh, the director was like, hey, I'd love to have an amputee compete. 
And I was like, man, I, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. He said, I've been waiting 30 years for someone like you to do this. And all the guys would pat me on the shoulders and they were like, so sweet to have you. You know, but they treat me like I, like, uh, I have a lack of certain cognitive skills, you know? They're like, Ladies and gentlemen, this is James. You go, James. That's right. They're talking as if I'm not there. Can he? Can he bend over? Does he? I'm like, yeah, I can hear you, and yes, I can. Right? So anyway, I get into this event, and these guys are all like, "It's just so sweet." And uh, so, and, and they're like, uh, "How many kilos do you want on the on the bar?" I was like, I, I really don't even know uh, the kilograms. What do you mean? Um, I don't know pounds, right? And so they're like, what, in the competition? I was like, you just, I'll, just whatever the last guy had on there, I'll just do that. You know, that's your piece. Right? Just leave it there. And so I go over, and, and I, so I squat, then I deadlift, and I'm watching how they do it. I'm just imitating. I end up lifting a combined score of 1620. That's bench, deadlift, and squat. All of those gave me state records, national <laughs> NPT records around all in one for my first show. And I had no idea how many pounds I was lifting at the time. I didn't find out that later, right? I was just like, okay, if the guys went from like he's so special that hey, that leg really helped him. That leg like, <laughs> him. <laughs> that leg was bionic. That leg helped him put up. And do so, so then they wanted me to get banned because, like, it was a PED or something, right? So I look at it and I was like, wow. Now, this, the way God even smiles on that, 1620 was my childhood address. It's the number I grew the place I grew up in ended up being the number I lifted. And I and I beat other guys who are all 275 pounds and above. That was my category. Lifting against 720 pound deadlift against able-bodied guys. Knowing that I had never done it before, I didn't know how much it was. I just was the adrenaline of the moment. I had always been lifting, but watching them go after it, I'm like, I just do what he does. And so I ended up setting all these records. You never know what you're capable of. And you also don't know how motivating it can be when other people don't think you can do it. The moment that they started patting me on the back like I was special, I was like, okay, I'm going to show you how special I am. <laughs> you going home second place. That's what you <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm crying right now. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, tears are running down my face. You were getting me emotional earlier, but you're just you're just making me almost pee my pants. Is what it is. Man. So he, help me with this too, because when we get, it's funny that you said the David Goggins thing too, because that's my brother. My brother called me the other day. He's like David Goggins. Like I got to meet him, and I watched it, and I was like, man, I don't know if I would want to like. If I started running and then he started yelling at me, I'd be like, man, let's go to Dairy Queen. You know what I'm saying? So uh, <laughs> and I'll be like, I'll meet you there. Like burn off the calories for both of us. I'm good. Yeah. Um, okay. But there's that there's that part of us that, uh, you know, when when they when they talk to you, I love how you said it so politically correct, too. You said I lacked certain cognitive skills. Um, <laughs> and when somebody tells you you can't, it creates a fuel, right? Oh, man. But, yes. but, but also, too, what I've found, James, is there's this place where if a person is just motivated by that, once people start uh -oh. encouraging them, once people start encouraging them, then they don't yeah. have anything to go against. No, so, you got it. Right? Man, I got a word. You no. You're going to love me. So, watch, I'm going to go back to a, a crazy moment. I was, when I was, when I lost my leg, and I, when I woke up and I saw it was gone, I was upset. Uh, the doctor leaned in. He's asking, so how are you today? And I grabbed my pillow and tried to hit him, right? Because <laughs> I felt like the guy took my leg, right? I, I set him up nicely. I was like waiting. As soon as he got close enough, <laughs> I gotta, the guy took my leg. I, I owe him one. You know what I'm saying? He didn't ask me. It's just gone. 
Well, anyway, my mom finds out that I, I was disrespectful to an adult. And this, and with her respect was everything. So she comes in and she was like, what's this? I hear that you did that. And she's like, you don't talk back to adults. You don't know. Regardless of the fact, I'm just upset my leg is gone. No one's addressing that. It's the pillow swing. And now they have me handcuffed, right? And in, in the bed, you know, for my attitude. So I'm, I'm sitting there, and I, you know, which would leave you down. All you can do is threaten with your mouth. Ooh, one of these days, I'm gonna, you know, there's nothing to do. So my mom walks in, and the nurse is talking to me about possibilities and hope for the future. She's like, listen, you're going to uh, be able to play sports. You're going to be able to do this. And my mom said, no, he's not. Because, see, I've never done any of those things in my life as of yet. You understand? So I, I as she's talking to, to me, uh, my mom asked the nurse to stop and she says, don't give him false hope. And she looks at me and she says, son, you'll never be able to use your body. You understand that? She says, you're a cripple. Do you understand that? And so I look over at my mom and look back at the nurse. She said, look at me. I'm your mother. And so my mom says, say it. You're a cripple. And when she made me say it, brother, something broke for a moment. Right. Because um, she slaps me to force me to say it. And in that moment, all my hope went out of me. So then when I got my leg and I started walking, I wanted to prove her wrong. That's the fuel. She said I was a cripple. She said she made me say it and I said it with my mouth and I resent the fact that I, I even said it or believed it in my own heart. So now I got to play sports. Now I have to lift. And that's why, I mean, I, I ran a mile every morning before school. I lifted weights after school when no one else was up. I put in the work because I was trying to prove her wrong. And when I got my first trophy and when I got my first championship trophy in state with the boys club and I did all these things, I, I went back and I thought I'd get validation and it wasn't there. The very people that you're like, once they see this, they will finally see my value and they'll feel bad about what they said to me. What they say is, I knew you could do it all alone. So the very validation that you sought out of that person, they never offer it anyway. So when your fuel is built off of the fact of proving them wrong, and they don't accept it, they don't acknowledge it. There's no Perry Mason moment where they go, oh my gosh, you were absolutely right. I was out of my mind to think that that never happens. And so when you don't get that, who are you when you don't have the fuel of hatred? Because when, when anger and all that stuff is within you, it eats up your capacity to love. You can't even embrace and live in the moments of when you win because it's all about proving someone else wrong rather than validating what God said about you to you. And then finally, you kind of plateau because if I don't have any haters, then what? You see, you don't need to live it for the haters. You got to find for the love because emotions, man, are a spark plug to the will, but emotions are like roller coasters. When you can get to your will, what's his will for me? What, what is it that wills me to motivate? Find the thing you're passionate about. Now it seems like, man, I just love waking up and doing what I do. That's a greater motivator to get me to the next level than hatred, anger, frustration, or prove them wrong ever was. You don't have a mic in front of you, but you could have thrown that against the wall at that point. Um, <laughs> talk to me about encouragement, because I think a lot of times um, I learned this the other day and I, I was I was blown away by it. A person uh, said, be careful of what you compliment or what you encourage your daughter with. And I was like, what are you talking about? You're just supposed to encourage him. He said, be careful. And I said, explain that. And he said, um, her beauty should be the last thing that you mm. encourage her on. Mm. And I said, and I asked him why. And then he said, uh, you know, he, we, we talked about it and then God opened up in, uh, Proverbs 33 or, uh, 31. Mm. And he said, compliment her on her confidence, on her value, on her hard work, on her perseverance on her intelligence, on her uh, ingenuity, on her wisdom, on her uh, prudence, on her honor, and then you can follow up with beauty. 
Wow. Can you talk about, because there's times where a person will see a situation and they want to encourage you. They want to encourage you. They'd be like, James, they want to encourage you. But sometimes they're just encouraging on something that doesn't really matter. And when we're encouraging kids on things that don't matter, then they start moving towards that, right? And so you, I mean, it's right in line with where, you know, when you heard a, and I can't even imagine, I mean, James, you're a miracle walking anyway, but the fact that the things that you endured, enduring that in the, um, in the hospital room, yeah. Yeah. When, where your mom forces you to say what, what she told you to say. Yeah. But talk about the impact of That's encouragement true. and, and yeah. being specific and, and understanding that. Once I understood that about my daughter, then I started to say, well, I need to think about my wife too because I was Come encouraging on. my wife a lot, saying, oh, baby, you're so beautiful. Oh, baby, you're so beautiful. Come but on. But yes. that, that can cause an insecurity in a woman because then she starts to think, well, what if my body starts to fail or maybe my body doesn't look exactly the same and that's the first encouragement? Is that the wow. reason why he's here? Well, wow. this is perfect. You see, um, I'm a patient emissary. It means that I, as an emissary, the word for ambassador is like that I represent Christ and I go into a cycle world and i can be in any environment and the purpose of it is to remember that i'm called with a purpose to impact lives to give them true encouragement and so as an emissary i go in and i see probably um in an 11 week period maybe 130 amputees uh would be veterans and i meet them at the moment where they are at the lowest I'm talking about it's like I'm in pain. I have phantom pains. And that's just, this is a great one for you to learn as well. You see, the thing that we have been complimented on may be your beauty your whole life. And you've been attractive. You've been a great runner. You've been a great athlete. But what else, who are you if you lose that? What values do you still have? Are you still beautiful if you've been disfigured? If, a, if an earthquake happens, uh, in Haiti, and then the, the building collapses, you lose your leg, you lose your eye, and, and now you're brought to America, and you, you're in a hospital room, and I walk in, and, and you've only been told you're beautiful as a little girl, and now I'm seeing you, and you're scarred. The room is dark. I turn the lights up, and I talk to them about how amazing they're about to become, because you are more than what you appear. You're more than the first layer of you. The epidermal is not enough. It has to be deeper than that, right? It is now you were just like everyone else, but God saw so fit to find you on earth. And you're, you're so unique that he said, let me give you something to make you powerful, right? A chapter that would turn the world to see you as more than just the exterior because filters can make you look beautiful. And then you have these things you don't look like you do online and all those things, which is a small little things that tear away at a person's self image. And if, if all you are are your aesthetics, but when you talk about things like your resiliency, your, your, your testimony, your impact or the influence you're about to have, or the fact that you finally are freed from the trappings of, of exterior stuff and that you can, you can now embrace every component of your life, that this brokenness can become the pathway to your greatness. That's why I share my story with them, that I can identify, that I, that I know what it's like to have people be like, man, you're big, you're strong, this, that, and the other. And then uh, they don't see me uh, know that I'm an amputee because I can hide it or I can mask it. Then they see that we take that off and they're blown away by it, right? And they realize that, my strength is not my exterior. It's the content of my character that was developed because of what I had to go through. It, my strength is, is the fact that I've learned that I got value even if I can't walk. If I'm in a wheelchair, I can be powerful. My voice can reach millions even when if I can't travel. There is so much more to us. So when he was telling you, what a brilliant thing. He's like, your daughter is more than the outside because the outside beauty is fleeting. That can be altered. That can be competed against. But all those other attributes, that's what makes you so unique, so valuable, so wonderful. 
and irreplaceable. No one throws away something that precious because the value goes up when you have that that courage, that perseverance, that character, that integrity, that stick to itness, that 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 joy that comes from within that is not based on it. There are there are to- totally different types of beautiful, right? If it's just the exterior, you'll get lust. But when it's the interior, you get honored. And honor is greater than lust will ever be. Wow. James, people talk about big breaks, right? And yeah. one, of my, one of my friends, Tim Story, who, uh, are, you, uh, are you familiar with Tim Story? Yes, yes. Okay, so- I saw it, well- yeah, just recently learned about Tim's story. Well, you need to meet him. You guys need to be friends. He's a friend of mine. I'll connect you guys as soon as, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make that happen. Um, he, is, he once said to me, he said, Kelly, there's no big breaks. And I was like, wait a second. Because he, he was on Oprah, uh, like he was on Oprah. You know, when you get Oprah dust sprinkled on you, then it changes things. Yeah. He's he, all around the world and all that stuff. And I said, well, uh, Tim, you had big breaks? Oprah is a big break? He said, no, yeah, Kelly, yeah. he said, he said, no, Kelly, it was a, a culmination of a bunch of little ones. <clears throat> now people look at you now and, and you're speaking all around the, uh, all around the country, all around the world. You're a model, uh, for, uh, Under Armour. You're, um, you know, you're on absolute motivation things like that. Um, and it all stemmed from taking on your own identity and saying like, I'm not ashamed of this identity, but a lot of people think it just uh, like you, you put the shorts on and bang, you're speaking to the world. Um, and then you're out there. So talk to us about some of the little breaks, uh, that that maybe you didn't even realize were happening because my pop said, and, and James, my pop said, he, he always said this. He said, um, he said, you never know where someone's uh, from. You never know where they're going. You never know where you'll meet up with them again. So make a friend out of everybody. Ooh, let me tell you, those small breaks, let me tell you. I um, I had a guy that was, so I was wanting to see how much I could squat. And the creator of the prosthetic that I had, for, uh, had a vice president, his name Shane Namick here, and uh, uh, he reached out to me, and he was like, "I see what you've been doing, and people are freaking out that you're going to break these legs. Uh, I want to donate an up- upgrade to it, and I would like to see how it does under pressure for sure." So we go to a, a gym, and we go to do a, a lift, and uh, so we're adding all the weight on, and uh, we ran out of weights at 700 pounds. Right, that's all they had for, and I'm doing uh, squats. And um, so I go, I, I power back up through. I go down again, I power back up through, and I was like, add more. Well, they couldn't add any more, and the thing was bending. And um, and I was like, well, I'll just do it for reps. So I do five reps. And uh, anyway, we were sitting there talking, and he was like, man, it's amazing, you know, because of what the lay can do, what you can do. And he said, hey, I've got a group of people we're going to be meeting at a hotel. If you could swing by and give me a pair of those uh, Under Armour shoes that you can get. And I had done a thing with Under Armour for amputees where if an amputee came, they got a special discount. Meet me at the store. You name it, veterans, same type of thing. Uh, they've done an appearance that way uh, at one of the brand house stores. And I, so I grabbed a pair of shoes for him because I could get him real discount. They were like 90% off. So got him a pair of the Rocks workout shoes. And he says, hey, can you drop them off at this at this hotel where I'm, where I'm meeting with six people? And I'm like, sure. So I drop it off. He said, you got a second, though. I want you to talk to the six people in this room for just a second. I said, about what? He said, anything. And I was like, all right, so what do they do? He said, well, they, they're with me. They make prosthetics. And I was like, man. And I was like, there you guys are. And I said to these, these people, uh, who would I be if I had met you earlier, right? And I was like, if I could have gotten this technology in 92, I'd been a world, I'd have gold medals at the Paralympic. Ch- I was I was faster than the Olympians running, and no one knew it because that, I didn't even know that was a possibility for me. You owe it to get out there to find the next James Dixon before he's in his 40s. You owe it to get active. You got to get, you know, I just challenged them. And I was like, I was like, you make dreams come true for people. 
That's what you're selling. You're not selling legs. You're selling opportunities to become whole again. And I just challenge them and I leave. Well, on my way out, they call me and they say, hey, are you, are you available to travel to Florida? I was like, for what? They said, one of the guys, of course, leads a sales team. Won't you speak there? I was like, oh, well, yeah, sure. He said, wait, wait. One wants you in California as well. In fact, you know what? Forget that. We have a national meeting coming up. We're wondering if you could be our keynote speaker for our national sales event. I'm like, oh, sure. It's, it's an international company. I go from speaking to six people to speaking in front of the entire country, right? Because everyone was from all over the U.S. And then they were like, hey, we want you to do something for us. And the next thing I know, I'm speaking all over the country. With, and I'm speaking, I'm at the, uh, you have Dallas with the Cowboys there in, in, in conjunction with Challenge Athletes. I'm in San Diego and I'm there with the Challenge Athletes and Bill Walton and all these guys are there and they're like, James, we want you there. And they started putting me in different places. Small things created from one small meeting that was for free. You end up doing opportunities that open up the doors. And then watch, you're talking about, about some big breaks. Well, actually, I was walking into the gym and I was trying to motivate myself. And you know how people always say, what you do in the dark will come into the light. And they will use it as a sense of shame. Like the bad stuff you do, God's going to shed a light on and expose you. Well, there's also the other side of that. The work that you put in at night when no one else is watching god will turn on the light and share that with others instead of it always being the negative and even though it doesn't seem like a new day doesn't begin when it's daylight the new day begins at midnight when it's still dark people don't realize that one small moment to be something. I said that in a 19 second clip about a new day begins at midnight. What you do in the dark is not about God exposing the negatives. It is about the hard work you do when no one else is watching will show up in the daylight and God will put your name in lights because of what you did for him in private. That, the owners of absolute motivation here and say, can we buy that from you? Buy what? That speech, it was like just 19 seconds. Yes. And the next thing and all, they're like, hey, can you do uh, content? Can you make more speeches? Absolutely. And then we built a relationship. And now he's like, hey, I want you to come to Dubai. And we're going to put on a conference. I want you to headline that. And I'm like, wow. Small things lead to big things. And then I want to use the, a small step like this. I was on with Louis Brown looking at a lie. Greg Reed shows up. I make a comment under his comment. We talk. He gives me his number. We talk. He posts your story, a small step, and you talking about skipping the lifetime opportunity of speaking, and it turned into hosting. I shared that because I thought that was a powerful testimony of an act of love from a husband to a wife as a man as an example there's no re wonder people come to the hideout it changes people it changes the focus and this september there, there are 12 spots left everyone should jump on that immediately because it changes life 12 that's what a number of disciples fill their spots up and then but to have those small moments those small steps then it led me to speaking to you Small things open up big doors. Brother, this is a big door. If Grandmama was here with us right now, which I know she is in spirit, but you got to look at her in her face, and the camera was her eyes, what would James say to her right now? I would say thank you. Thank you for loving me when I didn't even know what love was. Thank you for being my support. Thank you for teaching me that I was more than my disability. 
Thank you for sitting on the porch with me and instilling things in me now that I get to share with the rest of the world. Thank you for showing me what love looks like unconditionally. And thank you for allowing me to, to make you proud by what I do today. And I, when I'm done, I want to hear well done from him. And then I want to thank him for giving, giving you to me so that I could give that to the rest of the world. That's what I would say. James, you are a Superman. You are a Superman. Um, I, start, I, I started the podcast because of my kids. And uh, I wanted to show them that iconic, iconic people like yourself weren't superheroes, that they were real people with phenomenal attitudes and great work ethic. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both their names and refer to yourself as Uncle James, it would be awesome. You got it. Maddox. McKenna, this is Uncle James. I got one thing to tell you. You are part of a wonderful legacy. Everything that we are, everything that you, that is, all of our successes is to set up a platform that God's going to use for the two of you to take our message and our passions further. There's greatness in you. There is a great DNA in you. There's a great cause, but there's a great purpose. Never lose the love. Never think of it as work. Just allow it to flow out of you. The gifts are there. The talents are there. There is, an, there is a thing that I'm willing to you right now. Everything that is within me, all the talents and gifts that God has given, I speak into your life so that you go on and share the message. Never make it work. Allow it to flow through you. Speak from the heart. Speak from the soul. And let God take care of the results. I'm honored to watch you grow up, and I can't wait to sit back and hear what comes out of your hearts. Mr. James Dixon. I mean, it's, I was blown away for all of you out there listening. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for subscribing, doing all those things. But here it is for me where I look and I see James and I know he's coming to the event secret knock that we're doing on Monday or on Tuesday through uh, Thursday. But I see this larger than life, one of the top motivational speakers in the world, one of the most sought after. And I reached out and you hit me immediately. Like it was immediate. And I was so blown away because a lot of times people of your stature, people who have ex uh, accomplished the things that you've done and seen the things that you have, a lot of times they they turn inward. It becomes a focus of them. You made it everything about me. And I want to thank you for that, man. And I, I just want everyone out there that's listening, like the James that you're experiencing is the James that is when the dark, when the, when there's no lights on, it's the same. Yeah. It's exactly the same. And it's, I mean, it's just, it's so powerful to be able to spend time. I'm so glad that we got a chance to spend time together today because we're going to be spending time in a, a couple of days in person. And it is going to be absolutely phenomenal, man. You are, I, I, I tell you, it is a, it is an absolute honor and pleasure to be your friend. And, um, you know, I, I just want to, ha I want to have you on here more because people are already going nuts on you right now. Um, and man, this is awesome. And I tell you, it's, I believe it's just the beginning. I mean, it's just the beginning, um, for you, um, you know, obviously it's the beginning in your journey that way and things like that. But I mean, hell, if this is the beginning, I, I'm scared. Of, I, I'm scared. You're going to, you're going to be lifting like a planet. Like, you know what I'm saying? I, I just think it's so, I say, I think it's so amazing. James, you are better than advertised, man. Uh, my hat's off to you. You are incredible. Well, my hat's off literally, man. You have me crying on here. I was supposed to come. I was going to be tough. I was going to be like the motivational guys that go on and be like, God, I can't say just, just go through walls, man. Run through it. You can do it. So what? Your leg fell off. Keep going. You know? <laughs> Instead, man, we're on this thing. Um, 
I, I stand, man, on the shoulders of all the work that you guys have done because we keep propping each other. You responded to me immediately, and, and I'm honored. Man, I'm humbled. This is a new wall for me, man. Things that are, that are happening, uh, I can't make it up. You know, like, if and if I tell people, people look at you and like, man, how'd you get there? And I'm like, man, I, it's those small things that just keep happening. And then you realize, like, wow. And you realize God has said, man, listen, as long as you keep doing my will, I'll keep making a way. And when I make the way for you, it creates a path. It's a narrow way because it means discipline. It means sacrifice. It means humility. It's being authentic. Now, if I put on a performance and I just come on here saying cliches like, you can, you will, you did, it won't do it, man. It's been done, you know? But I stand here honored to be your brother, your friend, and uh, you're a titan among men. I mean that, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I love the fact that you said Titan too, uh, you know, cause all the, all the people out there, I'll do that one for the Oilers and I'll do that one uh, back there for Steve McNair. Uh, that's right in my, uh, in my background right there. And Earl, Camp, <laughs> Earl the Pearl is right back uh, is on that side too. So, um, but I, I, I appreciate you, man. It has been an absolute, absolute honor. And this is just the beginning. I mean, it's just the beginning. You put something in the, uh, the bio um, that we're going to talk about. And it is going, I mean, and, and it's going to be funny because I'm going to keep that. I'm going to screenshot that. I'm going to keep that. Yeah. I'm going to date it. And when we do it, then we're going to talk about it again. And it's going to be hilarious. It's going to be hilarious to, to, to see, but I, I see it. And I, I mean, it's already got my wheels going. So no. I want to, I want to speak and I want to speak some life into you, man. I mean, it, it it's unbelievable. Like you, <clears throat> you really take the brakes off of people. And I know that, you know, you make an impact, but I want to speak that life into you that you have no idea. You have no idea how many things you're confirming in that, that God is saying. And not only in my life, but in the lives of the people watching and, and listening and the people that you're touching, you have no, no earthly idea how much impact you're having. So. Man, I'm honored, brother. I receive it. I'm looking forward to this. We're talking. Uh, you, you see me moving around. I didn't realize that being an antiquated Android person would, uh, would be such a detriment. Uh, you're going to make me go to Apple. Uh, <laughs> like, I need to kill him. I need to kill him. Oh, hey, look at me showing this right there. There we shirt. go. I love that, man. <laughs> I, ne I, need, I need one of those shirts. I need one of those shirts. Yeah. So. I need one you of those as soon as possible. Listen, what you don't realize, I already made one for you, and look what it already says on it. <laughs> yeah, I already made one for you. That's what I was written on to get because, I'm sorry, man. I know I've been making adjustments at horrible TV, but I wanted to, to be able to show you that, that I have one already made for you because, um, brother, you're making me larger than life so that I can impact other lives. and. Uh, I'm looking forward to you. You are, uh, you're my brother, you're my friend for life. You know, this is not just for the, uh, for the moment. I'm looking forward to our journey. And with those who don't know, what I requested in my dream, I said is, uh, he and I are going to write a book together. He's going to help me be better. We're going to touch a whole lot of lives. And, um, and I just want God to be glorified from it. Don't forget, guys, 12 spots remain. Ooh. That's okay. That's okay. We lost James there for a second. Um, but you guys see why I have these types of people on the podcast. Um, it's amazing for me because when people talk about um, when people talk about impact, for me, it's one of the things that uh, changes everything. And when I first started the podcast and they uh, told me, uh, you know, when I say they, people told me that, you know, you had to do a specific thing. Um, you have to be a, in a specific place and things like that. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to, <laughs> my specific was people that were iconic that would come and have the heart of absolute lions, like what uh, uh, James does. And so my, it's been my honor and pleasure to have him on. Uh, I promise you, I will continue to bring real people on who are 
absolutely phenomenal human beings um, that have massive impacts in the world. And uh, the thing that I ask from you, keep listening, keep sharing, and keep subscribing on YouTube so my son thinks I'm cool. I appreciate you all. James is officially off the hot seat.